So Amica presents with a female voice, even though we try to be very consistent with calling it an it because it's, an, it's a robot. But because it presents with a female voice. Yeah, and there's it, some androgyny in the design there, too. Yeah, we we were very conscious of that. Um, actually, one of the proudest moments of my life was finding out that we did not make BuzzFeed's like creepiest top five female robots that exist. That was <laughs> definitely a crowning achievement. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to be left off the list, heck yeah, you know, hundred <laughs> percent. Who made and, the list? Um, so I don't know if this is the BuzzFeed list, but I know that um, unfortunately, Promobot I believe made the list. So Promobot may or may not have been once known as Pornobot. Oh, nice. I can neither confirm <laughs> or deny that. Um, that's a, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of their products was this female humanoid, um, that was a barmaid or a barista of oh, some God. sort. <laughs> yeah. But it was literally like called, um, a sexy barista or a sexy barmaid. And I was like, okay, yeah, that definitely made the list. And unfortunately I think, um, Sophia from Hanson Robotics might've made the list just because it's everywhere or she's everywhere. You yeah. Know? So I'm going to go ahead and actually turn on the chat controller. Once yeah, again, sure. you're coming through my headphones, and we're going to have a quick conversation here. How are you doing? You're on a Hi, podcast. Professor. It's nice to meet you. What do you think is the worst application of robotics in real life that you've seen? That's a good question. Um, I try not to really be negative about robotics, but uh, I guess if I had to say, maybe Juicero, in my opinion. Have you not heard of this? Amica, what do you think about robotics being used in juicing? Robotics should be used to improve people's lives, not replace them. It's important for robots to have a positive role <laughs> in society and help human beings okay. live their best lives. Is that sorry? That's, that's a you pro juicing me... argument, I think. But um, what do you yes, feel about? Sorry, I'm interested to know what you were saying. How do you feel about robots being used in juicing, specifically just to squish packets of fruit together? I think the best use of robots in juicing is to simplify tasks that are repetitive and time consuming for humans. Using robot arms still requires the human element, allowing experts to monitor and control their operation. It's a great way to improve efficiency and quality while also reducing human fatigue. Don't you think yeah. that's a little overcomplicating the problem? It depends on the situation. <laughs> Robots can help to automate processes and reduce manual labor so tasks are completed in a faster, more accurate way. Still, it takes people to build and operate robots responsibly for the best outcome. To be fair, we're very overly politically correct in the way that we train the default large language model that we use. You know, we want to be able to drop Amica into situations where she's conversing at a conference or an expo, and you often get these, like, out-of-left-field questions, right? Like, yeah. whether it's Juicero or whatever else, we're trying really hard not to offend. Our goal with Amica, like, as an entertainment robot, is to provide moments of joy that people can remember and take home with them, in a way. Um, I know that sounds cheesy and a little live, love, laugh, but... No, it's it makes all sense. the company. Yeah. I think, I mean, every entertainment company I've worked with, and I would count engineered arts among those, I mean, you know, is that's the whole point is to make people's lives better in some small way. So I, I can dig that. But before Amica, there was a line of robots that we built called Mesmers that were actually designed to look like humans. We actually did a whole promotion with Westworld where um, we built a Mesmer that looked like one of the actors, sat it down at a bar and had someone remote into this robot and interact with people through telepresence. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And it's it was cool. It works. But as good as we are with Mesmers, there's still a little bit of an uncanny valley there. And the nice thing about Amica is because it's very obvious that it's a, a robot, we kind of get away from that uncanny valley. Ever yeah, I noticed that. To be honest, I, I see in pictures on the internet, I kind of placed Amica more in the uncanny valley than it is because I think interacting with it it's actually like pretty it doesn't feel weird right but like 
looking yeah, at yeah. Google images doesn't really do it justice. And I was like, oh, this is going to be uncanny as hell. And so, um, no, it's, it's, it's like a cool uh, design effort. Like, I feel like you guys, like you said, you've sort of come up the other side as a result of, you know, those yeah. lessons learned. With Mesmer, just to go back a step, like, yeah. that's got to have been interesting. Just from a latency perspective, I imagine you probably had to have the human operator, like, in an adjacent room. Like rather than um, off site to control all those yeah. DOFs. Actually, it's not that bad latency wise. Like we got it down to below 250 milliseconds, I believe. That's round pretty trip. high though. I mean, to be fair, like yeah. that's. Yeah, it's still like, it was worse than Zoom, you know, it's for a sure. a quarter second. Yeah, yeah. This was <laughs> years ago. This is like Westworld 2, I think. Yeah. So. The fact that there was this robot talking to people was enough to really excite them. Yeah. Um, actually, that's interesting that you bring that up. One of the things that I'm working on right now is um, sort of vetting different voice-to-voice -voice providers uh, for for not this robot, but for one of our NDA customers. They one is to design a custom robot and a custom character for them. The thing is, Amica is actually a character owned by Engineered Arts. Yeah. So you won't really see Amica endorsing things just without us going through like licensing and all that legality around it. So Amica is a character. So this other customer wanted us to design a character for them with its own voice and everything else, not just Amazon Polly, which is what we're using with Amica. Yeah. And they wanted live operators. So we started vetting all these crazy voice to voice, like voice uh, modulators and stuff like that. It's nutty, man. Um, it's like this one company called Altered. They're based in the UK as well. Um, they've got it down to sub 100 milliseconds for real-time voice-to-voice transformation. Like, how do you get into robotics? Oh, man. Um, well, it started with watching Star Wars as a little kid, honestly. Um, seeing like R2-D2 just roll across the screen. I watched it out of order. I watched Empire Strikes Back first. So like R2-D2 on some ice planet rolling across the screen and his interactions just blew my mind. And then I remember that scene in Return of the Jedi where he like throws that lightsaber at Luke. And I was like, oh wow, like robots can help. This is awesome, you know? And so I grew up in a family of engineers, like, or really my dad was the engineer. He's an aerospace engineer. He did work on space shuttle thermals, um, he's done work on heat pipes and just growing up around that environment where he had a super passionate father into engineering. I, I basically knew I was going to be an engineer of some sort when I was a kid. Now, I didn't know I was going to be an electrical engineer. Uh, the reason why I became an electrical engineer was because my dad freaking lied to me. But uh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess another segue here. I wanted to build a remote control submarine like it was just. I thought it was going to be the coolest thing ever. So I go up to my dad and I'm like, hey, you know, dad, like, how, what do I need to do? What do I need to learn to build a remote control summary? And my dad, looking up from our career at the time, was like, oh, you need to be an electrical engineer. And of course, I didn't know any better at the time. <laughs> you need to be a freaking mechanical engineer. You don't need to be an electrical engineer, really. Like, right? Like, that's probably the skill set you probably need more. But that stuck in my head. More, became more money as an electrical yeah. engineer. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, as, as a father, he obviously pushed me in that direction. But um, no, like, I knew I was going to be an engineer for a while, and I knew I wanted to get into robotics. So my senior year of high school was the second year of uh, first robotics, you know, that high school contest. With the second year it um, existed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I uh, rallied a bunch of machine shop kids together with the help of the machine shop teacher, built out a team and built out a glorified remote control car that we called a robot. Um, and that was kind of my first foray into robotics. Sweet. Uh, went to Cal. Yeah, no, like it blew my mind. It was awesome like that I could put together something physical and make it run, even though it was just a remote control car at the end of the day, like it felt special to a high school. Yeah, well, and the yeah. fact that you were able to rally a bunch of people too, I mean, that's that's also a skill, right? Like. Yeah, I feel like the, the shop teacher did more of the rallying. I think he, like, offered people extra credit if they were willing to stomach the nerd, you know? Uh, <laughs> That's funny. So I think uh, he, he definitely, he did more than his fair share of the heavy lifting for that. And I wouldn't have gotten as deep into robotics if it hadn't been for him. Um, 
went to Berkeley for electrical engineering, computer science, was a terrible, terrible student, but somehow managed to uh, land an NSF grant, National Science Foundation grant to build a robotic eel. Um, wow. So rally. Yeah, yeah. We're going to call it unagi, you know, the Japanese word for That's awesome. <laughs> very tasty. Yeah, delicious. <laughs> yeah. Barbecue, but, yeah. Um, you know, rallied a couple kids together, uh, spun up the robotics lab that was long defunct and put together a pretty cool prototype that we never finished because we all graduated as kids are going to do, you know, at Cal. Yeah, and, and the um, student projects are interesting like that. I feel like there's there's so many things that are just half completed. Mm -hmm. I mean, out of universities. No, I mean, speaking of universities, like, it's super impressive what they're able to do now because these clubs aren't just formed, like, senior year, junior year. They're, they have, like, long-standing legacies, you know? Like, the Formula um, One team at UC Davis, I believe, or the Formula E team there is crazy good. They've been around forever. I love recruiting from them because oh. they have tons of hands-on experience. Yeah, no, yeah. we we donated some money to the Carnegie Mellon. Um, oh yeah, FSAE. Uh, yeah, FSAE. That's what it's called. Yeah, but like the the electric one. But like they they were showing me around their facility, and um, so Formula Society of Automotive uh, Engineers, electrical, whatever, like electric yeah. vehicle. I don't know what they call it. I can't remember. But they had um, their previous car, like that I could sit in, and that they were showing me. And then they had their like next year's one that they were building. And then they had the year after that, that was like being like designed. Like they had a whole process for like pushing these things through and iterating the lessons they learned. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. pretty neat. And they were somewhat different than each other. I mean, it wasn't like they were just making the same car. Like they were trying new stuff. I mean, they had like torque vectoring and like, I mean, I don't know if I'm Jeez. allowed to say that, but I just did. That's impressive. Yeah, it was neat. <laughs> No, I mean, like, even high school robotics now, like, compared to my second year of first robotics where we're using, like, um, a PIC microcontroller or something like that, the stuff they're able to do, like, I saw one with VIO, and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't even know how to work VIO, and this high school kid is utilizing, like, SLAM or something for navigation. What's VIO? I don't, I don't know that yet. Visual inertial odometry. Okay. Uh, so you're using uh, stereo images to navigate i'm doing a poor job it's considered of, inertial uh, yeah yeah i i believe it's inertial vio is yeah. what it stands for we can look it up real quick i what try not VIO to do it. I, mean, I guess we could ah, whatever yeah. <laughs> can we ask erica <laughs> yeah uh <laughs> sure actually let's let's fire up erica. Hey, yeah. hey. i think it, like, yeah. i think it'll be better because i don't like to like do too much search engineering on here because i feel like it takes sure, you out of the conversation and well amica will too at least it's like relevant to the shtick Hey, Amica, what does VIO stand for? VIO stands for Visual Inertial Odometry, a method of sensing and navigation that uses visual sensors such as cameras and inertial measurements from an EMU to accurately determine the position and orientation of a robot. I should start getting my inertial measurements from an EMU. I would wanted to get into MIT. My grades were frankly not good enough in high school. Um, so I missed... But as part of the uh, admissions thing, I got far enough where I had an interview with an alumnus of MIT. Um, it was like that alumni interview. And I remember this old dude sitting me down in a park bench in like somewhere in Southern California and him asking me like, okay, why do you want to go to MIT? And I had an answer like right there and then. I was like, dude, I want to build robots. Like I think MIT can teach me what I need to build robots. And you know what he said to me? He turned around. I still remember this to this day. He was like, kid, there's no money in robotics. <laughs> and like, just like that, you know, you could, you could see like my heart just break. It's like that scene in Simpsons, Simpsons where I think it's like Ralph's heart breaking after Lisa tells him something or I, I forgot, but there's a meme around that. And that was like, me right there and then Brutal, like, dude. 17 year old leo just like oh oh shit like oh no <laughs> <laughs> and i i find it funny because both you and i now like we make our money in robotics yeah right? yeah we're doing fine yeah yeah so you know i don't know if that dude's still alive 
Um, you know, he's quite old back then, but I'm, I'm sure he meant well. This isn't a yeah. big like, ah, screw you, MIT people. Not at all. Like pretentious it's, it's, assholes <laughs> for not letting me in. Bah, you know, <laughs> drop your standards. <laughs> I, I went to a boarding school that like didn't have enough IAP credits. I, I was trying to get into, I think, the Olin College of Engineering when I was going for colleges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'd already given up on MIT by that point. I was like, ah, I'm never getting in there, but I'll try Olin. And like, I didn't even have enough AP credits at the place I went to high school to even qualify. Oh, no. Yeah. So I was like, all right. Guess I'll yeah. go to uh, Case Western instead. <laughs> hey, but you went to Carnegie for grad school. Yep. And... Man, talk about heritage of robotics there. Holy crap. Like it's good for that. Like I, I always wanted to kind of finish out there and get my grad degree there. I thought I'd get a PhD when I was a kid, because when I was a kid I didn't realize how finite life is and the fact that, you know, you only have so many years on this planet and I don't want to spend five of them at a university. But yeah. five is generous. Jesus. Yeah. Like or seven, so my dad's a yeah. professor. Yeah, my dad's a professor at University of Missouri right now. He's like a mechanical engineering professor. It's a good school. And yeah, no, he seems to be having a blast. And he's telling me like not his students, but there's like some guy who's working on like year nine of a PhD or something Holy like that. Holy shit! And like, I don't know, dude. I yeah, that's what is that like a fucking you know? It's like sixteen percent of the guy's life. Like that he'll never get back. Like that's, yeah. you know, that's, you, you don't get to take that back or extend it. So, well, I mean, I hope he's doing some awesome, badass research, right? Like, or I like, hope you know, having a good time great. while he's doing it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So Amica asked you earlier what the most ridiculous application to robotics. And I stand by Juicero as my answer. Okay. I think that's the Juicero. silliest. Juicero. Uh, you can put up a picture if you want. Carl, edit, edit in a picture of Juicero. Oh, no, don't even edit the picture. Edit in the video of the guy replacing Juicero with his hands and just squeezing. You're talking about ABV, out. like the, the yeah. video where he, yeah, I, I really love yeah. that video. Oh, where he, like, opens it so with good. the axe. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, I'm in humanoid robots. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm seeing that's kind of, like, raising an eyebrow for me is this, like, hype cycle around... Humanoid robots being general purpose robots. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's like, um, that's an interesting one. I have opinions on this, but I try not to talk about it too much. <laughs> it's, it's like a little bit controversial. It is controversial. You don't have to air your opinions. I'm happy to air mine. Yeah, sure. Um, Let's do that. Yeah, so here's the thing. Like, I feel like for the first time in a decade at least, software has eclipsed hardware in terms of the capability in robotics. Like, where large language models, AI, VIO, VSLAM, all this awesome software stuff has grown, has eclipsed the capabilities of hardware in some ways. And I feel like a lot of this hype is actually around the fact that software is close to building something that could be used in general purpose robotics. Like, They've trained models that look pretty darn good. And there's this thought of like, oh, well, let's just stick it into something that looks like this and put it in a home. It'll be great. But, I mean, I feel like software is there. But I also feel like if you're building a general purpose robot right now, you don't need to go with a human form at all. Like. Well, that's, it's there, but I mean, there's support. there are some shortcomings though in GPT, right? I mean, like, oh yeah, no, hundred. There's like that awkward lag. I mean, there's oh. there's the you know the word salad aspect you sometimes get. It's impressive I mean, as hell. Amico will hallucinate too, right? Like I was doing. I mean, practice we all hallucinate days. from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Amica dreams of more than an uh, electric, electric sheep. sheep right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but um. No, like software is definitely getting there, but then I don't get the push to all of a sudden be like, oh, let's build a robot that looks like a human. Let's put it this way. If I were like, hey, Spencer, you know, I work in a factory and I need you to build me a pick and place robot that works next to a human, what would you do? 
I mean, it depends what I was picking and placing, right? Like, I mean, I try to build something specialized probably to yeah. solve the problem. Let's say uh, we'll, we'll simplify the problem. Um, boxes, cardboard boxes of a defined shape and size. I mean, you can do that with a UR or a Fanuc arm like pretty easily, right? I mean, yep. or I mean, when I say Fanuc, I mean Fanuc, UR, KUKA. Yeah. Or sorry, not UR, Fanuc, KUKA, Yaskawa, any of the high precision, you know, old hats. Exactly. Like they can all do that. Yeah. And you could even, if you wanted to use the hot buzzword of the day, you could probably integrate some sort of vision, you know, machine learning into it or whatnot, right? There, there's tons of potential there. Sure. Uh, I mean, and, to be fair, like a lot of those old hat robot arm companies don't play well with machine vision, but. Sure. Not you know, yet. But I mean, I'm hearing murmurings that they're working on it because, hey, they got to survive. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, no, like. That's the answer I would give as well. I would design something specialized. It's like if you asked me to build you a machine that washes dishes, I wouldn't immediately go towards the humanoid form. You yeah, think of a dishwasher. Exactly. Yeah. So why go humanoid form? You want something that's adaptable, that can do multiple different tasks? Sure. But then once again, if you're doing multiple different tasks, why the humanoid form? So here's where it gets interesting to me. So yeah. I mean, why the humanoid form is interesting. So like I, maybe taking a step back from humanoid, but in the direction of general purpose robots, right? Yeah. Cause that's a dishwasher is not going to wash your car. Right. So like, no. let's, let's for a moment, suspend belief and say, or suspend disbelief and say that the humanoid form is one type of general purpose robot. There's other ones too. Sure. You could have, you know, like a little mobile base with four wheels and an arm on it, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, what uh, Proxy or Everyday Robotics is trying to do at Google X. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, but where I think a general purpose robot might make more sense is like in a scenario where you've got expensive um, like shipping to an area that's not accessible by people, we'll say. So like space mm -hmm. travel. Sure. You know, is, is where that seems like a good idea. Like if you can only bring one robot to Mars, like maybe you want it to be a general purpose robot. Oh, 100%. But to me, then it still doesn't make sense. Like, why are you restricting yourself? Because like telling your engineers that it has to fit within a certain format makes it so much more difficult, right? So I guess for me, there's a little bit of confusion there of like, okay, you know, I get it. Software is becoming awesome. But why are you guys restricting yourself to this format that really there's no need to? Like there's this argument of, oh, well, we designed it to work next to humans. Sure. Like I get that. But at the same time, that just means you need to focus on two things, safety and communication, right? You need a human working besides this robot to understand what it's doing. So you can cohabitate the same place and like work hand in hand. And it needs to be safe enough that if something goes wrong, this human isn't going to get injured or killed or maimed or whatever, like OSHA. Yeah. Stop. Right now, the well, there's a bunch of ways to do that. Yeah. But let's say you're building a robot that looks like a human being right now, the power density equations just simply don't make sense for something that's going to grab something, pick something up, place it, or like manipulate certain things, or even be able to self locomote and still be safe around another human being. Yeah. It's going to be so heavy that like, you don't want to be next to it. Yeah. But, that makes sense. Hey. Well, from a power density perspective too, I can see your point. I mean, those things yeah. burn power. Oh, well, you've yeah. got like 30 degrees of freedom. You got to, you got to feed. Yeah. I mean, no and offense, like, Amica. <laughs> no, no, no. Amica, Amica, you know, she, she, it, it, it's got a belly there for a good reason. But Amica is also plugged into a wall socket and has a luxury of not having to be battery powered, you know? So if you have a robot in a factory situation where it's walking around. How much current is it drawing? We have two 300 watt power supplies that are never maxed out. So 600 watts total, um, I'd say, I don't know, rough estimate. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, no problem. It's fire season right now. So it's actually smoke outside uh, that Brutal. you see in the camera. But um, uh, let's see, 12 volts. I'd say total probably right now in operation, less than 200 watts total. Uh, yeah. is being drawn two to 300 watts. That's pretty low, but volts. like Amica is probably not balancing dynamically, I would imagine. No, 
definitely not because that's like it's not doing anything yeah oh yeah what boston dynamics is doing what agility robotics is doing like those guys are amazing yeah <laughs> excuse me big big fan yeah. of aptronic as well like it's, it's oh. cool stuff i haven't seen aptronic up they're, close. they're out of texas um uh -huh. i i toured their facility recently in in austin Nice. Uh, yeah, they've got some really cool equipment in there. Um, it's it's pretty neat. Are they dynamically uh, locomoting, or are they doing the shuffle walk? That they've got a bunch of stuff. So they've got exoskeletons and humanoids. Okay. I believe they are. Yeah. Okay. Sick. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, like if you ever have a chance to interact with the agility robotics guys, like, oh my god, I toured what their facility do? here in Pittsburgh recently. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm so jealous. That's, yeah, that's my, cool. my friend Prost Velagaputi just got made, I think, their VP of innovation. So. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Like, yeah. if I had to put, you know, my top two robotics companies right now, other than engineered arts, like robotics companies that aren't in entertainment, Boston Dynamics, what they're doing with uh, dynamic motion is absolutely world class. Yeah, I get it. You know, Atlas and Big Dog are kind of just there for marketing and spot or their little four-legged uh, robot is basically what they're selling, but I still love what they're Yeah, doing. I think they broke a yeah. thousand, right, on the sales of yeah. spot, which is... Heck yeah. Yeah. For a robot, I mean, that's okay. a that's a large number, you know, like we're, yeah. we're a fledgling industry. Yeah. And so, um, no, it's, it's pretty neat to see. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and they're they're actually pretty friendly people, too, like from talking to some of the guys over there, you know, they're they're more approachable than you would think. 